Hi everyone and welcome. And um, I'm going to, um, let's see, we have 20 people on here. I'm going to wait maybe a couple of minutes before starting in case we have uh, more people joining. Does that sound good to people? Sure. Okay, great. Okay, let's get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and um, uh, welcome to the Institute for Policy Studies. And you know that uh, normally we would do it in our conference room, but in these different times, we are doing this event online. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with IPS, we are one of the oldest multi-issue progressive think tanks uh, in the US. We were founded in 1963 uh, by Dick Barnett and uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm stuck on the first name. Why am I st stuck on? Um... Marcus. Marcus Raskin, right. <laughs> For some reason, I, I was on an email thinking, you know, uh, seeing Jamie Raskin's name and I was stuck with that in my mind. Yes, Marcus Raskin. Uh, and the premise of IPS in the beginning was to uh, specifically uh, resist the Vietnam War, uh, but our founders realized early on that you cannot fight the Vietnam War without also uh, fighting for racial equality and gender equality and fighting against corporate power and so on. So we were very multi-issue right from when we were founded. And um, the specific program that I lead at IPS is our climate justice program, uh, which looks at addressing climate change not merely as a technical issue uh, that is solved through better technology, but at its core as a social justice issue, uh, as an issue of uh, racial justice, as an issue of economic justice, as an issue of uh, breaking the stranglehold of white supremacy and corporate power uh, in our country and in the world, frankly. Uh, and, you know, because without doing that, we cannot fight climate change in a way that centers the needs of those who are most harmed by it. Uh, and uh, so very briefly about uh, technical details here, uh, please use the chat box, and it's the um, uh, it's the icon called chat, and on the bottom of your Zoom screen for any questions and answers. And I would request people to hold Q and A until the end, unless you have a quick clarifying question where you don't understand something a speaker is saying. Uh, and please address your uh, question in the chat to everyone so that everyone can see the questions. Um, and with that, 
uh, I want to jump into this event and very pleased to have Stan Cox and Lissy Kroll here with us. Uh, Stan Cox has a new book called The Green New Deal and Beyond, and I'm going to post a link to the book in the chat. Uh, and you can read a description of the book on there, and, you, and there's even a buy button, and you can buy the book on there. Uh, and uh, I will confess, I haven't read the book yet, uh, but I am fascinated by its premise, and I would love to read it. It's on my list of what to read in the next uh, uh, few months here. And with Stan is Lacey Kroll, and let me just quickly introduce the two of them. Uh, Stan Cox is a research fellow in ecosphere studies at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. Um, and is the author of five books, including the one we'll be discussing today, uh, The Green New Deal and Beyond, uh, Ending the Climate Emergency While We Still Can, uh, which was published just last month by City Lights Books. And joining him today is Lisi Kroll, who's a professor of economics at the State University of New York in Portland. And her research areas include political economy, human ecology, and the evolution of economic systems. And her present research focuses on the emergence of agriculture and the configuration of human economic order into an economic superorganism. Fascinating term. I'm not sure I completely understand it, and I would love to know more about it. Uh, the focus today is obviously about Stan's book, but um, uh, at some point, if we have a minute, I'd love for Lisi to explain what that means. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, let's see, where was I? Yes, uh, she's presently involved in the Land Institute's Ecosphere Studies and New Perennials Project Initiatives. And uh, with that, uh, Stan and Lissy, you know, um, structure the discussion honestly any way you want. Uh, so for about 45 or 50 minutes, would love to hear you go back and forth and discuss the book and insights from it. Good. I think Stan's going to start us. You got to unmute. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Basov. I've been looking forward to this a, a lot. Um, uh, uh, Lisi is a, a good friend, and we we work together some, and we've been uh, um, really um, eager to get into some things here today. Um, the Green New Deal vision is really two things. There's the New Deal part and the Green part. The New Deal part is pretty good with its uh, job and income guarantees, um, health care, um, economic justice, and racial justice. That, that last one um, is an important break with the original New Deal, which was not about racial justice at all, and had some had built in um, uh, racial discrimination in it. And of course, these things are even more timely now uh, with being in the middle of uh, economic collapse and uh, a pandemic and uh, the racial injustice that is still um, with us. Uh, on the other hand, the green part of the Green New Deal is inadequate to the point of being self-defeating. When you look at the congressional resolutions, um, that um, are really all we have, the Joint Congressional Resolution, which was um, uh, submitted to Congress um, last year, um, they um, don't say much about how um, uh, greenhouse emissions are going to be 
uh, eliminated, or even if they will, there's several points for agriculture, uh, manufacturing, um, uh, transportation, they say, uh, eliminate emissions as much as is technologically feasible, which could be, um, could be anything. Um, now, um, you know, we'll see when the, um, when, when the full plans are unveiled, but um, uh, for the, from what I've um, heard from them, there really isn't much uh, plan to do that. It seems that it's uh, more like, let's see how far technology and a big industrial initiative in the market with maybe a nudge from carbon tax can take us, but uh, that's not far enough. What it needs is a direct mechanism to drive uh, you know, uh, for the, in, in the most important instance, drive fossil fuel extraction and use down to zero on a, a strict schedule. And, um, uh, but that's not what's uh, happening. It's a kind of a built-in assumption that building up solar and wind um, energy and green infrastructure um, that simply building all of that up will um, by itself drive fossil fuels out of the economy and displace them uh, jewel for jewel. Um, this is not uh, the way things uh, work in history or in um, empirical studies. New sources of energy have always um, been adding, they have always come on top of the existing sources of energy, adding to the total energy supply. So for example, in the late 19th century, when uh, oil use became very common, uh, coal use continued to rise right alongside it. And after World War II, uh, natural gas use incre started increasing dramatically, and so did oil use, and, and so did uh, coal use. And then, uh, over the past uh, 10 years, with a, a, a very uh, rapid, um, on a percentage basis, increase in uh, wind and solar energy, the uh, use of uh, oil and gas has uh, continued to uh, increase in, in this country. Um, coal use has tapered off, but uh, that's mainly because it's being replaced by natural gas for um, electricity generation. Um, but um, if, if we really are going to manage to drive oil, gas, and coal down to zero on what um, uh, appears, if you take into account the IPCC and the UN Emission Gap Report and so forth, um, we, we need to do it to stay, to uh, prevent runaway warming. Those all three need to be driven down at, at about seven or eight percent per year of the original amount. Um, that only can be done by having a statutory limit on the amount of oil, gas, and coal that can come out of the ground and into the economy uh, each year and 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 declines year to year. And I'll uh, talk about uh, what the way I see that happening as we go on. Um, so it's the direct suppression of fossil fuels that will stimulate demand for wind and solar energy. It's not uh, the cause and effect don't work uh, the other way around. And if we do manage to pull that off and we reduce fossil fuels as fast as is necessary, there's no way that the buildup of um, um, non-fossil energy is going to be able to keep up year to year and compensate for the diminishing supplies of fossil fuels, especially when um, you uh, it's going to also have to replace um, uses of uh, fossil fuels in which they're directly burned, as in transportation and so forth. That's going to put an even bigger burden on the buildup of electricity and there are other problems with that. With that. 
Uh, so we are going to be living with a declining energy supply. Um, the um, uh, the uh, usual um, argument then is, well, that's okay. We're not going to need uh, as much energy in the future because we are improving efficiency so much and doing a lot of other things that will decouple um, uh, growth of the economy from uh, mm -hmm. material and, and uh, energy use. Um, uh, this um, is, uh, decoupling is, is uh, kind of a magical, uh, magical thinking because it's assuming that we, the economy can continue to grow at a, it's what is considered a, the a healthy pace as, it, as uh, you know, a few months ago as it was growing um, in, in perpetuity. And that uh, increases in efficiency will um, uh, take care of that. But that, um, it, that doesn't happen. Um, you know, many studies have shown that um, in any in broad geographical er eras over um, long periods of time, that has not happened. And when it appears to have happened in a country or region, it's because they are not counting in, in the um, material and, and energy input uh, into the economy. They're not counting the material and energy that were used in another country to manufacture and then transport goods uh, in, into the country. Once you add that in, then um, decoupling um, evaporates. And, and even if it, decoupling is sustained for a while, you have um, the, um, um, and, and growth is continuing, uh, gr growth um, goes on an exponential curve, a certain percentage every year, um, increases in efficiency, or, or you say the in material input for producing a dollar of GDP, if it's dropping over time, it can't drop forever. We don't have perpetual motion machines, so that, that flattens out, and then growth takes over, and um, you uh, have an um, endless increase in the use of energy and materials. So there's a very simple reason that now for um, uh, seven, uh, three, four decades mm -hmm. that any time serious proposals were put forth to um, seriously reduce um, greenhouse emissions, that they have been um, rejected by governments, by corporations, et cetera, because uh, they're, um, quote, bad for the economy, meaning they're bad for profits and, and capital accumulation. Um, but um, if that's the case, then are, are, are we really saying that, the, uh, uh, that we'll tolerate the end of civilization so that we can continue to have uh, economic growth um, in, in the decades ahead? But it's not... Um, it, it, it's not that uh, bleak. A low energy economy could be designed and can be designed to be a better economy. Um, for one thing, uh, abundant cheap energy has, has not been an unmixed uh, blessing. It has empowered uh, um, militarism, imperialism, uh, exploitation of working people. Uh, it, it has um, there is a lot of expenditure of um, energy that we definitely need to do without. And we, um, and we can still have a, a life in which people have, um, have a good standard of living, quality of life, uh, but are not, there isn't an obsession with always um, acquiring or generating uh, more and more. Uh, energy. And um, I think uh, Lisi is ready to uh, give some background and flesh out some more about these, uh, these issues. Well, I'll try. Um, Stan's absolutely right. Um, uh, renewables, it, 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 
with the way that they're uh, projecting to implement renewals through market mechanisms and without questioning broader, broader dynamics of growth and problems of inequality, um, they won't, they'll merely augment our increased demand for uh, energy. Uh, and he's absolutely right about uh, efficiency, that there are limits to efficiency. You can't have you know, absolute uh, uh, decoupling. Although in uh, ecological economics, that promise sort of appears as this idea of development without growth. Uh, it's masked in that idea that we can have an increase in GDP and it doesn't have uh, uh, any impact um, materially. Uh, and I think, that's an, I think that is a, a proposition which is uh, intended to um, allow us to uh, not have to get into the nitty gritty of, of, of our economic system and really think about what it's about. Um, and I think it's important, so what I want to do here is just give you a little bit of context. I think it's important to understand something about the economic system and its relationship to energy, because I think if we don't understand that, we're not going to be successful in coming up with plans that will uh, uh, um, try to uh, mitigate against climate change uh, and confront the difficult circumstances that we, that we confront. So I'm going to give you a very simple kind of uh, rendering or rendition of uh, uh, the relationship between um, uh, our economy and energy. Um, everybody understands that our economy has an expansionary dynamic. That's not new to anybody, okay? But what people often don't understand is that that expansionary dynamic was fully in place before we started using fossil fuels, okay? And I think that sort of separating those two things is important because it gives us insight into the uh, inherent uh, kind of uh, uh, structure and dynamic of the system, and then it allows us to see how energy enhanced that structure and dynamic. Um, so start here. Think about profit as surplus, okay? And in a capitalist system, producers gain profit by producing goods and services and selling them for less than their competitors do. Okay, that was true in early capitalism. It's more complicated now, but that's how they do that. Um, they're required to do that by the system because if they don't do that and reinvest, they won't stay in the system. They won't be able to stay in the system. So the system has this kind of expansionary uh, 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 dynamic, this dynamic to produce surplus in the form of profit and keep investing it and the system keeps rolling, okay? To that end, it's actually necessary to try to undercut your competitors. And the most logical way to do that, and certainly the, the way that has, uh, uh, that it's been done throughout history, is to try to lower your labor costs as much as you possibly can. So what you want to do is you want to control your labor force. You want to mechanize if you can and, um, and control them in that way. You want to pay the lowest wages that you can get away with paying. And, and that way you can expand your profits. And this is exactly what was going on in the textile mills in uh, uh, England in, in the late uh, 1700s. And they were not uh, fueled by fossil fuels. They were fueled by falling water, okay? Fossil fuel was not a part of the mix. What happened was they began to have problems hiring workers in the rural areas where the falling water was. So fossil fuel actually resolved the labor problem because they could locate closer to better labor markets in, uh, in uh, uh, cities that we're now starting to develop, okay? So it wasn't, uh, Andreas Malm has written a book called Fossil Capital where he makes this argument and I actually think it's a sound argument. 
And, um, and so they moved to uh, urban centers where in England they had access to global markets through shipping, okay? They uh, start to engage with uh, uh, building factories using fossil fuel. And what the way I think to think about what fossil fuel does is it further mechanizes, further uh, uh, re reduces uh, 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 per unit costs. You can get economies of scale out of it. You can better uh, discipline your labor force because they essentially you know, become better cogs on the machines. And uh, you can do that. And, uh, and that's exactly what happened. And so fossil fuel facilitated that process. Okay, so I like to think about uh, fossil fuel as the ultimate enabler of market capitalism. It allows the system to be more of everything it's inclined to be. More expansionary, exploit workers better. The problem with it is that it also leads to the mass production of goods, because you do get economies of scale. And when you start getting that, you also start to get problems of stagnation or more severe problems of gluts and stagnation. And so um, the, the problems of unemployment and stagnation are as inherent and as much a part of the system as the dynamic gr of, of growth is to the system. Okay, and all of that is exaggerated uh, with the use of fossil fuels. Okay, so it's counterintuitive to think about the system as removed from the earth, but in a sense, when you start using fossil fuel because your energy is virtually unlimited, and it has been, the system is released in a sense to be more fully what it is, okay? And, and that's precisely, it sort of plays out its logic and that's precisely what happens. Um, so the system has grown and matured around that dynamic and, and around that energy source and fossil fuel now provides, still provides 80% of the energy used in this expansion, expansionary system, okay? Now, the prescription for stabilizing the system in the face of its profound problematic tendencies with stagnation, unemployment, inequality, is to reinvigorate growth, okay? That's what Keynesian economic policy is all about, right? Um, we use monetary and fiscal policy to try to restabilize the system once it becomes unstable. And that produces more growth in the system, okay? So um, the New Deal actually was part of that legacy, although it went beyond that legacy. Um, the outcome of this sort of ideologically is that we've come to believe that we have, uh, uh, that we can manage the system that the system can expand without limit, um, and that we can, uh, and, 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 and everything will be okay, okay? So let me just recap. We have an expansionary economic system, expanding as if there's no biophysical basis. It's enabled by fossil fuel. It now has almost 8 billion people globally participating in some form or another. It's producing climate change, the sixth mass extinction, and it's a system with chronic problems of stagnation uh, and inequality. And of course, again, the main solution to the stagnation and inequality is to reinvigorate growth, okay? You can understand when you're presented with a conundrum that we're presented with. Because the conundrum is really we have to grow and not grow the economy at the same time. When you're presented with that kind of conundrum, you can understand why it's enticing 
to fall back onto fall back onto sort of our our tried and true and well established ideologies and institutional arrangements. Okay, this kind of notion that the renewable energy industry will replace the fossil fuel industry if you provide enough incentives. Um, if you pr pr provide enough incentives, that transition will take place. And in the process, uh, the people that are unemployed in the fossil fuel industry will be re-employed in the renewable uh, energy uh, industry and things can go on as before. So you basically fall back on an ideology of technology can solve our problems, human, human ingenuity can solve our problems. Okay, now I wanna make, make it clear. I'm not saying that renewable energy, uh, the deployment, the, the deployment of re renewable energy is a bad thing. I think we need to deploy renewable energy. We just can't expect it to do what it's not going to do. And that's the thing that we have to think about. And let me add just a couple more thoughts about uh, kind of understanding the economy. Um, this more on the micro level. Um, we, we have this belief that if you give the incentives, the renewable energy uh, uh, industry will develop, it will become more efficient, it will lower its per unit costs, it will attain economies of scale and put the fossil fuel business, the fossil fuel industry out of business. That's the promise. But you have to ask yourself this, how efficient would production in renewable energy have to be to compete with oil that's now about $35 a barrel and coal that's about $40 a ton, okay? All of which we have an established infrastructure around, okay? And that's the thing about markets, right? The less you demand of oil and gas, the lower their price will go, okay? And so there's this countervailing kind of force against exactly what you're expecting the markets to do. It makes the competitive battle for renewal, renewables even more brutal, okay? And there's another problem, and that's the kind of belief system and ideology. Can we really replace fossil fuels with renewable energy and have an economy that continues to expand at about 3% every year ad infinitum? Can we do that and provide 8 billion people with access to energy, okay? I think that's a, that, 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 that is not clear to me. So I was attracted to Stan's work because Stan actually confronts the reality of limits and thinks through in a very systematic way about a path forward. So I'm gonna kick it back to Stan. Okay, okay. thanks, Lisi. I, um, I, at the risk of uh, sounding like a presidential candidate, uh, I, I have a plan and you can read about it in my book. <laughs> But I'm going to just briefly um, describe um, uh, what it is that I've concluded is the only way um, uh, out of this uh, mess. The, um, and, and as I uh, mentioned before, that requires a national uh, cap on all uh, uh, fossil fuels the number of tons of coal, uh, cubic feet of natural gas, barrels of oil that can come out of the ground or in through the ports and into the economy in, in a year. Um, and then this cap has to ratchet down year by year um, on a, a very brisk schedule till it gets to uh, zero. Now there, there have been, uh, the idea of a cap has been around for a couple of decades and it is 
uh, typically then a cap on emissions. So you track the quantity of emissions from each source and then you um, limit the, uh, the amount of that uh, source. But um, last year, uh, Larry Edwards and I started writing about this uh, direct cap on the quantity of the fuels that um, gets them all out at, at the same time, because um, that's what the IPCC and UN Emissions Gap Report, that's what they, they say has to happen, not only with fossil fuels, but other sources uh, as well. Um, now, if, if you have a, a law like that and it's enforced, um, the uh, coal, oil, and, and gas companies are probably not going to go for it. It's, to have a business model that says we're going to put ourselves out of business in 15, 20 years, um, they, they, they're uh, not going to do that. Um, so we're, it, we're probably looking at nationalization of uh, fossil fuel industries. And so let's, uh, let's say that's what happens. And then we have uh, pe uh, people's carbon, the, the uh, public cooperative that handles our dwindling coal supply and people's hydrocarbon for oil and gas. And they not only need to administer the, um, the uh, movement of these uh, products into the economy, but they're also going to have to, through um, some mechanism, it could be like the uh, War Production Board uh, of the wartime 40s, um, to steer energy resources toward um, uh, producing essential goods and, and services in a way from wasteful and superfluous uh, uh, production. And so uh, energy may go toward uh, building up a, a massive uh, in increase in mass transportation systems, ground transportation, uh, at the expense of um, uh, going to air travel. It might start the air, um, <clears throat> airline industry of um, access to fuel. Uh, or to producing staple foods uh, at the expense of um, uh, the feedlot industry and, and feed grains uh, going into cattle. Um, those kind of decisions may have to be made. Also, in, in a parallel to the 40s, um, if there are, um, if there is um, a dwindling supply of energy, uh, which there will be a fossil fuels, and as Lisi and I are saying, there it, it won't be made up with by uh, um, non-fossil electricity. And then there's going to have to be for consumers um, rationing of uh, energy uh, resources, um, meaning the um, um, keep being kept track of, say through your um, utility bill or. Uh, purchase of uh, vehicle fuel. Um, so their um, price control, both price and co controls and rationing will probably be necessary. But it's important to stress that it's not rationing that suppresses the um, fossil fuel burning and the, the, and the carbon dioxide emissions. Rationing is an adaptation to the need and, and the fact of um, suppressing the overall supply uh, directly through the, this cap that's declining. Um, and during World War II, the rationing limits were set nationally, the same for everyone, but they were administered locally and democratically um, through local rationing boards. And, and we should, um, we should say uh, in inclusively as well, and they, we, we should follow that example, have a lot of local control as long as everybody's uh, playing by the same rules. And, uh, but to make sure that uh, fairness uh, for all really means fairness, fairness and sufficiency for all. And that's where 
the economic justice provisions of the Green New Deal would, for example, would become even more important. Um, and <clears throat> because you know, marginalized and frontline communities uh, uh, suffered most of the excesses of capitalism, the um, in, environmental damage, including climate change, now uh, the pandemic, uh, law enforcement, are, those um, negative impacts are going to have to be um, be dealt with. And, um, and that's going to include, you know, okay, everybody may um, have um, fair, the equal amount of access to uh, the, these resources, but if they don't have the money to buy them, then it doesn't mean anything. So a lot of the um, talk about um, uh, guaranteed uh, job guarantees and income guarantees or universal basic services and uh, with healthcare at the top of that are going to have to be uh, in place. Um, now the um, Green New Deal resolution, uh, joint resolution in Congress that I referred to before, it's, um, it's silent on the subject of growth. I don't think the word growth is in there, but it's nothing if not a stimulus plan. And so as this is saying, it's, uh, it's going to be um, a, a Keynesian, Keynesian stimulus. Um, and right now, people are looking at that and saying, well, it, it, that's exactly what we need. And it's, uh, it's true, we do need, and we're getting a little bit, we need more massive government intervention in the economy. But when we come out on the other side of this pandemic, if, and returning to endless growth uh, is going to be the top priority for business and, and government, and, that, and that's gonna have to change. Uh, and, and a lot of people are already talking about the Green New Deal being uh, a major vehicle in in doing that, returning to the growth path. But as Lisi pointed out, unrestricted economic growth, it, it lies at the root of all of these problems that we're, uh, we're fighting now. And, the, and also the inequality that is uh, a, a, a very inherent structural part of the system. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. So, um, and, and that's why a restoration of GDP growth after the pandemic won't make our society more just and more humane. What will improve the quality of life for millions of Americans is to cure those distortions of economic power and the uh, cruelly uh, high levels of, uh, of inequality uh, that we've got. Um, um, and then finally, after the uh, pandemic, and who knows when that's going to be, it's probably going to be a long time, but um, return to business as usual would mean not, a re uh, not an improvement, but a return to economic misery for much of America, un unless we um, take some of these steps. Um, and it'll be accompanied by a surge of uh, greenhouse emissions. Yeah. And the, uh, the pandemic, I hope have, for a lot of people has shown a light on our, our dire need for uh, a different kind of economy and, and one that puts the needs of people first and doesn't um, just create and manufacture and innovate whatever is going to earn the higher, highest rate of profit. Um, and it could be, um, it, well, the, um, the degrowth folks uh, largely uh, in, in Europe, also in this country, uh, are talk about how at the, at the center of that is probably going to be um, uh, a 20 hour work week or some um, shorter hours at, at full pay, which would be needed in an energy frugal economy. I mean, there'll be, there'll be also increases in jobs for um, it, it functions that are now um, accomplished through uh, 
through machines and, and, and uh, fossil fuels that may, uh, we may have to go, go back to other ways of doing those that will involve more people. But a lot of, uh, a lot of other uh, production and a lot of other services um, will not have enough uh, energy to function. And so um, it could well be that we, uh, we, we all have a lot more um, uh, leisure time in, in, such, uh, in such a world. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, yeah. I just want to reiterate or just emphasize uh, again, I, I, I sound a bit like a broken record, but uh, um, the necessity of providing economic security, not through job growth, but through an expansion of the social welfare system. No. That is absolutely essential to the climate project because you won't get the will to impose a cap if people feel threatened. No. They, and, and, and at this moment with the pandemic and everybody wanting to get 20% 20, 20, uh, of the population 20% uh, uh, unemployment, you know, there's a tendency to say what we need is job growth, job growth, and we do. But we need, as much as we need job growth, we need an expansion of that social welfare foundation. You know, jobs are not providing people with livable wages. Stan already touched on, you know, health care and, you know, universal health care. And honestly, women are killing themselves and some men around care work. They're killing themselves because there is not enough support for that kind of work going on. Those kinds of things are essential, foundational to the transition out of fossil fuel, I think. Not and so uh, finally, um, I, I'm, not, um, I'm, I'm not naive about the, uh, the uh, possibilities for uh, our country, our government to uh, go down this road. I, I wrote the book as a way of saying um, this is the huge transformation that's going to be needed if we, um, if we are going to get uh, through this with the climate emergency. And, and so it's kind of like uh, planting a flag out, out there way out in front and saying, if we don't go that far, I don't, we're, we're not going to make it. And so, so that when we hear half measures or, or e easy solutions being proposed, um, it, it, we, we have to say, uh, if we pass those, um, it, it, we're going we're gonna to remain in the situation we are now, and we we could get to the goals that they that those kind of plans have, but a number of years will go by have gone by by then, and that uh, flag uh, is going to be just as far away. And so, um, we'll uh, um, you know if y'all want, want to talk about the the. Uh, Political feasibility of all this, uh, this we can. Um, but I, I just um, one more thing. I in the book I was trying to uh, talk about the the potential of um, con consumer strikes, not um, not to substitute for the cap, but just as a way of getting our energy use down. And and um, I wrote that, um, ju just imagine that if we had a, a mass boycott of air travel and, and like 95% of people said, I'm, I'm going to refuse to fly. <laughs> and, and so the manuscript uh, went in with that in it, or the final proofs went in with that in it. And then within a, a month or two of that, we, we actually saw it happen. Of course, it was an imposed uh, limit. and, uh, and it, 
and the kind of degrowth we're seeing now is chaotic and not not the kind you you want to see but it does show that uh, the entire country almost stopped flying and it uh, and we've survived so far Lucy, do you want to make some closing comments before we move into the closing phase? Um, I think I'm. I think I'm good. I, I. I think we. We. We have to. You know. Imagine a world of limits, and it's hard for us to go there. It's hard for us to imagine a world with limits. You know. Imagine we don't get a vaccine. Imagine that renewable energy cannot replace fossil fuel. That's the place our imagination has to go. Um, and then we start thinking about things in that context. I mean, I really think that we have to, we have to start imagining a world of limits. That's an essential thing. And the pandemic Actually, you know, it's it, it it might make us do that, but it it's also frightening because the pandemic shows in no uncertain terms how much trouble we have with limits, right? Because the 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 lockdown was an imposition of limits. Okay, and the economy came unraveled. <clears throat> so we've got a problem on our hands. So I, I, that's, those are my closing uh, and, and, and Basa, that um, um, makes me um, think that um, <clears throat> also that we have in the first, um, for the first time in a long time over the past three months, I've heard more talk about um, wh what are essential goods and services and what, what aren't um, than uh, yeah, ever my time, I guess, since the, the 40s probably. And um, I'm hoping that, that, um, that all this discussion of that can maybe plant a, a seed of a bigger discussion in the, in the context of the ecological emergency and, and really force hard thinking about what we uh, can and, and cannot uh, do without and to um, um, say, okay, certain things are absolutely essential. Some are nice to have if, if you have the resources or if you can get away with it. And then there's a whole other class of production that you know, we just can't afford to do anymore. Thank you so much, Stan and Lucy. This was very, very thought-provoking. Um, so I'm going to close out the presentation part with a very brief optimistic intervention. <laughs> and then I will, um, I will use my moderator's privilege to ask the first couple of questions, one each of Stan and of Lisi, um, and then uh, get into Q&A. Uh, so very briefly, the realization that building up renewable energy and building up clean transportation and energy efficiency, et cetera, is insufficient and will not get the job done to uh, address greenhouse gas emissions is fortunately actually gaining ground in, uh, you know, interestingly, both in grassroots environmental justice movements and in bigger environmental organizations. So for example, when the first Green New Deal resolution came out, one of the big criticisms from um, indigenous-based organizations, Native American organizations, was precisely this, that why is keep it in the ground not a part of this framework? Uh, because the extraction of, uh, or extraction and transportation of oil and gas is killing our people. 
and um, you can build up all the renewable energy that you want, but until you limit that, you're not addressing the problem. And likewise, among um, kind of the green NGOs, uh, that understanding has also grown that uh, just politically, if you have this powerful industry and its infrastructure in, in place, uh, that sort of acts as its own extra market driver for fossil fuels. And unless we can dismantle that industry, that power block, so to speak, pushing against addressing climate change meaningfully will remain in place. Um, and so a few recent initiatives around that uh, one is this thing called Stop the Money Pipeline campaign, which recognizes that it's not just the fossil fuel industry itself, uh, but our banking system, our insurance system, et cetera, that are keeping this industry afloat. Uh, for instance, um, uh, lots of big banks, including particularly the two bad ones are JP Morgan and Wells Fargo, have pumped in billions of dollars into fossil fuels even just in the last five years. Uh, since you know, these issues have come to people's attention on a worldwide scale and you had the Paris Climate Accord, et cetera, even after that, they've pumped billions of dollars into um, fossil fuels. And obviously insurance companies ensure these risky businesses and help them function. Uh, so Stop the Money Pipeline very directly goes after the banking and insurance sector for the way they keep fossil fuels afloat. Uh, and then there is a coalition that um, emerged what feels like six years ago, but was only February. Uh, an informal supply side coalition that looks at all of these issues, uh, looks at uh, number one, attacking the finance, number two, attacking the infrastructure, which would mean uh, the extraction infrastructure, the transportation, meaning the pipelines, et cetera, the refining, the export terminals, et cetera. And then uh, putting limitations on exports, because one of the things that's really driving domestic fossil fuel production here in the US is exports of oil and gas. And even in some hypothetical world where you know, building up our renewable energy would actually displace our um, uh, domestic fossil fuel consumption, that will not help if we keep digging up the stuff and exporting it. Uh, so, so there's that. And then there is an ad hoc coalition that's come together to stop the ongoing bailout of fossil fuels using uh, the coronavirus crisis as an excuse, uh, which is completely a sham because of course the decline in oil and gas industry long predates coronavirus, and it was partly a, you know, a crisis of their own creation, that uh, it's the overproduction of oil and gas over the last 10 years uh, that led to this environment of low prices that then the uh, price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia and then the coronavirus drop in demand kind of pushed over the edge. Uh, but the conditions were created by the U.S. oil and gas industry for the last 10 years. Um, and, and then finally, uh, there is an initiative that's actually started exploring the possibility of a government takeover of the fossil fuel industry with what we're calling a managed decline and a just transition for workers as well as communities who are dependent on the extraction so that we are not solving this problem on the backs of workers and communities. And the reason I bring up communities is that uh, the fossil fuel industry very much seems to, even domestically in the US, 
uh, works very much on a model of resource extraction colonialism, where you have uh, coal dependent communities in places like Appalachia, oil and gas dependent communities in places like West Texas, who are literally like paying for their public school teachers out of revenues that they earn from these extraction industries. And that makes them subject to the um, boom and bust cycle of these industries. Uh, so right now they're very much in bust. Uh, and, you know, uh, so, so the whole concept of a managed decline with a just transition is to ensure that yes, we take over these industries and wind them down, but we do not do it on the backs of these workers and these communities. Um, and um, that conversation is at a very early stage and I'm very supportive of that conversation, but uh, personally I've you know, thrown in one complication in there, which is that uh, when we take or we as the public takes over these companies, let's create legal mechanisms that we are not taking over their debt. Uh, so um, we leave the big banks who made irresponsible loans to these companies stuck with their bad decisions instead of we the public being, you know, owing them. Uh, so, so that's my optimistic comment. <laughs> now, um, Stan, and in the interest of time, I'm going to ask just one question. Uh -huh. Both of you, Stan and Lucy, instead of uh, asking two questions. Um, so my question is, uh, I would love to hear you elaborate more on the point that I brought up about, let's suppose we are building up renewable energy and let's suppose that purely from the standpoint of market forces, they are competitive with fossil fuels. What do you see as the possibility that in spite of that, just raw political power of the fossil fuel industry would keep the industry going? Oh, right there. Um, even if, uh, renewable energy is uh, very uh, economically competitive and um, uh, preferable than to uh, fossil fuels. There, that um, that, that has happened um, in the past too. New sources of energy um, being um, being cheaper and, and more uh, desirable, but. Um, there, um, we're still in our economy is still in the mode of wanting more and more energy, and so um, whatever buildup of renewable energy there is um, is going to uh, be added to the uh, fossil fuel um, supply, uh, both because they're very powerful corporations and want to keep doing it, but also. Uh, because, uh, for for one thing, they um, we, we're we're wanting to support um, growth, and, and especially at this point, uh, want to um, have more growth, which requires more energy, and also for the many technical reasons that um, that renewable energy won't be able to. Fill the um, fill the void if if people do um, say or, or people you know utilities whatever say okay we're going to um, produce more um, we we want to buy more energy from the renewable grid and so forth it'll be overwhelmed pretty quickly at this point and they to produce enough electricity they'll um, they'll have to continue turning to uh, fossil fuels to uh, not only to maintain our energy supply, but to uh, increase it. I guess I'd add to that by saying, I think, you know, the more like, I mean, we act like the fossil fuel industry is belly up. 
there are a lot of fracking corp companies that are belly up, okay? And they're gonna get gobbled up by the big oil companies at buy or sale prices, because that's the way the system works. And there'll be further consolidation in that oil and gas industry, to be sure. There's nothing saying that the fossil fuel industry won't go in and buy up renewable energy companies. Why wouldn't they? If they're profitable, they'll buy them up. That's what they're in the business. They're in the business to make money. And Stan talks about, you know, having to manage renewable energy. You know, you can get yourself in a position where you've got everything to manage it and more and ever more economic power. So, um, I mean, I don't know, I'm not an expert on the industry, but just understanding what I understand about the forces of the economic system that would suggest to me that that's a possibility. I mean, there's no reason why renewable energy is not gonna be consolidated and uh, power structures are not gonna be uh, built around renewable energy uh, unless we make sure that doesn't happen. And, so. and, uh, oh, sorry, Lisey, go ahead. Go ahead, no, I'm done. Um, <clears throat> And, but and that's a quite likely scenario, uh, and and you know they you already see ads on TV when they're where they're boasting about their renewable divisions. But at at the time the pandemic hit, anyway, there were I think 500 new pipeline projects going on around uh, the United States and Canada, um, uh, and so and it, I forgot what uh, uh, what kind of investment that was, but it it was going on. These companies aren't planning for uh, fossil fuels to go anywhere. Um, a lot of it was uh, connected to the Permian Basin in Texas, but they, are, um, they, they were all over the U.S. and Canada. Um, they wouldn't be spending that kind of money. If, well, they probably wouldn't have if they had known the pandemic was coming, but they wouldn't be spending if they were planning to uh, leap over in to um, renewable energy. So, uh, uh, in response to the concern that Lisi raised about um, the clean energy industry consolidating, the, sh the very quick sad answer is they already are. Mm -hmm. uh, already we're seeing um, fewer and fewer corporations starting to dominate that industry more. Yeah, of course. So there's an urgent need for democratization. Yes. So with that, I'm going to move to the questions in the chat. And um, uh, before going to the questions, I'll just point out in the chat, um, Herb Simmons shared a, a small grant program for anyone who's interested. So, uh, helpful resource to people, so please check it out. Um, so very quickly, there are three questions in the chat and I'm going to um, paraphrase them a little bit. And um, uh, I'll take the liberty of going backwards uh, because I feel like um, uh, the last question is probably the one that's most um, uh, uh, most um, uh, germane to the discussion we've had, uh, and it's about uh, fossil fuel taxes as a way to reduce consumption combined with the universal basic income. Now, how do you see that playing into uh, your proposal? I'm going to let Stan, Stan take that because I think he can answer. I know he can answer that question very well. We're beyond the point at which uh, taxes could you know, get this under control. It might, you know, maybe if in uh, 1990 we'd started doing it, but even then I'm, I'm not sure. But at, at this point, the 
the side, as uh, economists like Lisi would say, that it is that demand for energy is highly inelastic. So, um, as the price or the tax that would have to be um, applied to, say, gasoline or electricity would be have to be enormous at this point to cause the, um, the necessary uh, shrinkage in, in demand. Um, there, um, yeah, there have been several um, estimates of this, but um, they, um, uh, the famous Nobel winning economist, William Nordhaus, um, in, uh, in uh, either last year, 19, or 2018, um, ran his the same models he had been running but using the new um, estimates of you know, uh, how you know, how much carbon budget we have left and so forth and how fast we have to eliminate emissions and he and he sort of threw up his hands because he was saying that even if we're trying to stay below two and a half degrees of war warming which is about a whole degree uh, more than what we can really stand. Even at that point, he said the uh, the uh, carbon price required for that would be uh, so enormous that um, it, it, he said, you know, the economy couldn't uh, function. So he said, so it's not practical to um, try, try to keep uh, below those uh, temperatures. Um, in, instead of saying we, we, we need to figure out another way to do it. Um, the IPCC um, in their 1.5 degree report that shook up the whole climate movement in October uh, 2018 um, said that it, the, um, the price of carbon, if it were done that way, would have to escalate um, um, very sharply so that it would um, be, I believe they, they said by the year 2100, it would have to be $27,000 per ton of carbon or something uh, ridiculous. Nordhaus was balking at $1,000 uh, per ton. Right now, the carbon um, price in the carbon markets in uh, Europe and Japan is kind of comically small. It, I think it's Three dollars in Europe and six dollars in Japan per ton. So yeah, that's certainly not going to do anything. Okay. So um, I'll. Uh, so one other question in here. Um, it's again. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit to make it shorter. But um, uh, do you see a possibility of focusing on emissions alone, not, not addressing the intersections of, of uh, uh, you know, climate change with other things like globalization of health threats and widening economic inequality, et cetera. Lisa? So say that again, ask that again, sorry. So essentially, um, how do you see your proposals of um, uh, limiting fossil fuel production to address the climate threat? How do you see that intersecting with the, you know, uh, with global efforts to address, for example, global economic inequality or global pandemic? I think, I mean, I think Stan can also respond to this, but I think, as I stressed before, the problem of inequality is a precondition for doing anything about climate change. Mm -hmm. It's not an add-on, it's a precondition. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think that, and Stan will talk to this, that it is going to require the idea that it's not going to require sacrifice from the top third of the population who are 
the benefit beneficiaries of the economic system in some sense is not realistic. So there has to be some dramatic redistribution that goes on in terms of access to energy and in terms of income. Mm -hmm. Stan, I'll let you ask, uh, answer too. Yes, as for the uh, global picture, the, the focus of the book was on, because it was about the Green New Deal, it was on what, what we need in this country beyond that. But uh, then as for the global um, situation, I, um, I said a, a few things. One of them is that, um, first of all, um, what, and again, just about what this country can do, one thing is to stop doing a lot of the, the stuff we're doing now. The, um, uh, not only uh, imperialist adventures, but um, even the, the um, uh, these uh, gimmicky uh, carbon offsets, which generally mean that we can keep flying in, in airplanes because we're going to establish some uh, uh, phony uh, tree planting um, thing in another country. Or, um, I, but I went through the um, these studies of how uh, offsets, the impact of offsets. It's always that folks in other countries are worse off than than they would have been without them. Um, we we're limited in the, the positive stuff we can do, but um, if we, and, and we certainly have no, um, no standing as a country to be lecturing other countries about how you, you have to uh, uh, cut your emissions. Uh, for, one, for one thing, we have, um, you know, a lot of countries don't have emissions. They, can cut, but but also we, unless we um, take very serious action and uh, and really uh, show results doing it, um, we we can't really talk to the rest of the world except to do whatever we can to um, uh, help resolve the the uh, various economic and social problems. But if we do take dramatic action, very radical action on this, um, we at least will um, be able to uh, um, uh, set an example. It may inspire movements in other countries uh, to do the same. But right now we're doing the opposite. We're leading uh, the world in, in the wrong wrong direction. Also, asking whether there needs to be some reparation, you know, because the U.S., it, you know, the total cumulative, uh, we have 28% of the buildup owes to our, uh, our uh, fossil fuel uh, use. There has to be reparation. Um, and I think, you know, Bernie Sanders and the people who are talking about the Green New Deal with him have talked about, uh, you know, funding for technology, for renewable energy, for developing countries. I think that absolutely has to be on the, yeah. uh, on the table. Now, having said that, um, you can't have, uh, I mean, I don't know how it's going to work. And I, I don't know how this is gonna sound, but you have an emerging middle class, for example, in India of 500 million people. Um, and I don't know, you know, that, that's sort of a different dimension than providing reparations. That's a dimension that too has to be dealt with, uh, sort of how, how that plays out. But there's no question but that the um, the U.S. and other uh, developed countries who ha are responsible for the vast accumulation need to be engaged in some kind of reparations. 
Great, thanks. And um, in the interest of time, I'm going to combine two questions into one and um, uh, apologize for this, but could be the last question we do with. Um, so uh, leading progressive figures such as Bernie Sanders and Bill McKibben uh, seem reluctant to talk about the needs for serious limits, I'm presuming, to economic growth. Uh, and um, so two questions are one, number one, is that accurate and, and why? Uh, and number two, um, question specifically for Stan, um, do you know of anyone who's trying to develop, you know, relationships with the, uh, the, for example, the Democratic Party's platform committee and the Biden campaign and leading candidates for office to try to influence Green New Deal policies to be, you know, more receptive to ideas of limitations to growth and limitations to production. I'll let Stan take it. <laughs> okay, let's see the, the first question. Well, oh yeah, about, yeah, the, um, the reason the Green New Deal caught fire in, um, in late 2018 and through 2019 and was, um, you know, became the conversation in the climate movement is because it doesn't address limits. And so, um, whereas a lot, a lot of um, you know, climate uh, um, proposals, you know, back through the 90s, um, all were setting limits. They were saying, you know, there, there have to be these limits. The, um, the Green New Deal, at least so far, has um, just proposed that by you know, taking on this big industrial push, um, the the um, the emissions will go away, and and I think um, uh, Bill McKibben and others, I, I, you know, I can't read their minds, but I think they're thinking, okay, let's at least let's get this done um, without. Um, uh, telling people that um, because we don't want people to lose hope without telling them this isn't going to be the, the solution to the problem. And so that's just um, kind of a, a, a guess of mine of, uh, of what's going on. Um, I mean, and it's always been presented or it, it often is presented as a fight against the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. Um, and I think that's uh, a problematic way to frame it um, because we have an economic system that's functioning on 80% uh, of uh, fossil fuel, this massive economic system. And it's not just a matter of a, a problem with corporations. It's a matter with a problem of, and I think that was in a sense what I was trying to get at uh, in the first part of what I presented, that there are systemic, that, that there's a dynamic and a structure to the economic system that we have to reckon with a little bit. Um, it's not just about taking down big oil. It's about rethinking how we structure uh, an economic system. And I, I think that that may be why they, they don't talk about it in a sense, because when you get into the issue of growth, you do have to start to go into that. Um, and I think that may be part of the problem. You know, we certainly should be removing, getting rid of the subsidies to the fossil fuel oh, yeah. companies. We should, we, we should, you know, every university and pension fund should divest of their stocks that are in fossil fuels. But we can, if we succeed 100% in that, um, the fossil fuels aren't going away they're, they're, unless we directly uh, eliminate them. Yeah. 
And then, okay, Batsab, I'm sorry, I forgot the second question. Uh, the second question was more like, uh, kind of how are your ideas that you've art articulated in that book, or are those ideas being oh, yeah. up to political mm -hmm. electoral circles? Yeah, so I, <clears throat> I do know people in the um, in the climate movement who uh, I I uh, can't uh, say who they are, but they they're you know they're not the headline people, but they are in contact uh, have been for some time with um, um, people in you know. And people like congressional aides or the think tanks who are writing the Green New Deal, um, and they have um, been um, they've been pushing for this idea. And what one of them told me uh, that there there will be certain uh, uh, people who are involved, you know, fairly you know, high level um, staffers, so forth, who will say, um, I I agree with you, you know, that, that's really what we need. Uh, we just got to get this thing through first and, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about that. But um, if, if it's going to be a huge heavy lift to get the Green New Deal as it stands passed and then to turn around and say, well, um, in addition to that, we've got to do all this is, uh, is going to uh, kill it. So I'm, uh, I, I think we, we have to be uh, honest with people. There's one, um, if you want to see a very comprehensive uh, plan for not only uh, um, greenhouse emissions, but resolving all, or not just fossil fuels, but all the other sources of greenhouse emissions and broader ecological destruction and a way to, um, to do this that is um, a lot of it uh, influenced me in writing this book um, and I, I I guess I had influenced them in doing that and then they influenced me but they're called the the climate mobilization it's the climate mobilization dot org mm -hmm. um, and uh, certainly look them up and they have a a, a big uh, proposal called a, a victory plan that um, is aimed at uh, a lot of the stuff that I've talked about. Okay, that brings us to time and it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Stan and Lisi, and I'm really, really looking forward to getting your book and reading it. Uh, and I hope many others on the call do the same. And uh, thank you all of you for, um, for spending an hour and a half of your Thursday afternoon evening on this and um, hope to keep seeing you in different spaces, Stan and Lisi. Lisi, I know you and I were on a, um, a recorded panel together on Monday. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone. And thanks for attending this event. Yes, thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Thank <laughs> thanks to everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our pleasure.